Good evening, everyone. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for coming out on the hump day to hear my stories. I will try my best to keep you entertained. So, first, first of all, a little bit about myself. Uh, my, again, my name is Juan, I originally come from China. And after getting my bachelor's degrees in computer sciences, I came to the States and got my uh, master's and PhDs in environmental sciences with an emphasis in microbial ecology. And now I'm working at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory, AKA the Mag Lab, in analytical chemistry. So basically, I am a microbiologist working with a bunch of chemists in the physics lab. <laughs> so it's, I guess it's a natural feeling to, to feel like the dumbest in the building most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so today I will tell you a story about predators. Back to science. So when I say predators, what comes to your mind? Uh, probably you already seen the like... Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the lions or sharks or whatever large flashy animals, right? But today, actually, I'm going to talk about a mysterious and dangerous predators that you can only see through a microscope. Uh, so here, the predator is that weird looking guy with a long tail in green. So it, different than the uh, microbial, uh, in the animal world, in the microbial world, it's usually small, it's big. The major bacterial predators included protists, which is a diverse group of uh, eukaryotic microbes. And all, we also have viruses attack bacteria. We, uh, we also call it bacteriophages. But little is known about, about another domain of life, the bacteria that can prey on other bacteria. Uh, the, this group is collectively called as spidelovibrial and the like organisms. I know it's a long name, so uh, we say balos for short. So they uh, they kill and attack other uh, they attack and kill many other bacteria in the different mechanisms than viruses and protists. So there's a quick cartoon uh, animation that created to show the, some of the general features of balos and its life cycles. So it's a gram-negative bacteria, a curved shaped. It is extremely small, about one micrometer in length. So, uh, so, so that's why it's called wo the world's smallest hunters. So this, but it's extremely fast, powered by the long tail called flagella. Sorry. So in the environment, they will search for the prey. Once they zoom in the target prey, here the prey bacteria could be an E. coli cell or a salmonella cell, they will amount a fierce attack. They will squeeze in, penetrate the outer Me uh, cell membrane and uh, 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 elongates inside, use the cellular content to feed themselves, and then they elongate and make new progenies inside. Uh, and then eventually they burst free from the prey cells and, um, and release the new progeny, and then the search again uh, uh, happens again. They search for new target bacteria. So Overall, they make their living by attacking and devouring other bacteria for their own propagation. I started working on these bacteria since graduate school. Now, 10 years later, I'm still fascinated by these extraordinary predators. So that was a cartoon illustration. Now I'm going to show you uh, some real world, uh, watch a real video uh, generously contributed by my colleague, Rory. And this is how it look, actually looks under the microscope. So the largest cells, largest cells here are the predators, uh, are, the, are the prey. And the, the, those fast swimming smaller cells are actually predators. I want, to, uh, let pay, I want you all to pay attention, it's a very short video, uh, to pay attention to one prey cell here. Like you see, there's, there's uh, this one. This guy already have a, a predator attached to the real end of the prey. So then eventually they swimming around, eventually stop the struggling, and, uh, and then the predator gets his food. How is he doing? How? Uh, that's, that's a very good question. That's the mis mi that's a mystery. That's still a mystery. Whether it's by random collision, they just find them by random, or there's some chemical sensing process, chemotaxis, it still remains un unknown. 
But it's really a big research question that we want to address in the future. So here are some more electron micrographs uh, that shows what it actually looks under, under the electron microscope. So here is the uh, uh, predator attached to the prey cell. We'd like to record, uh, uh, call this picture the kiss, the kiss of death, because once they attach to this, the prey cells, uh, that symbol, uh, symbolize the death of the prey. So here in graph B is uh, when the predator is actually inside the prey cells. So these are the, sing, uh, the we cut. These are the uh, we cut the cells in sink sections, so you can see what's inside the cells. So this, so in, at this stage, you can see the the um, the predator is already making progenies inside the cells, and then the D, uh, the graph D is the final stage before they burst the the prey cells and release their progenies. So it's a very cool process. Because of the predatory nature of balos, many groups were use, considering using them as a ther living my, uh, antibiotics to treat infections. Now you may think that using bacteria to treat bacterial infections sounds like a crazy idea, right? So actually, compared to the antibiotics and or genetic modified organisms, these bacteria may represent a more, and may serve as a more natural therapeutic agents against, against uh, pathogens. And among the few studies that do actually explore the Baylor's uh, uh, therapeutic potentials, most of the studies yield, yield very promising results. Here I want to just highlight one uh, study conducted by a group from UK where they orally administered uh, the predator bacteria to the young chicks to treat a salmonella infection. Uh, salmonella is a pathogen, you probably, uh, pathogenic bacteria you probably heard a lot uh, through the, the news related to food poisoning and outbreaks. It is actually the, the second most common uh, intestinal infections in the US. So what they did is they first dosed the balos to the healthy chickens and then find balos has actually uh, no harmful effect to the, to, the, to, the, to the birds. That's a good news to us. Many man animal studies have shown that balos can only replicate inside the bacteria cell and does not attack human and other mammalian cells. So, so this is like, uh, we, it's safe, to, safe for you and me. Relatively speaking, so here the pictures are the seca from the uh, from the, chi the from the birds. If for the, the normal ones, we have a dark fecal material like showing this picture, and uh, the sick ones infected with semolana will look pale because of the infl uh, inflammation and the uh, white blood cell infiltration. So it will look like uh, almost white and uh, have loose fecal fecal material. So the the group that the, 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 when they dose the bacteria uh, the predatory bacteria to the Salmonella infected ch uh, chicken, they find out the, the actually they were able to successfully reduce the infection. The seca here now looks pretty much like the normal ones, like the in the healthy chicks, and then they also injected the non predatory balos that are not able to kill in the Salmonella and they find that they still remain, the chicken uh, still remains sick. So that's definitely a proof to show uh, Belo has the potential to reduce semolana uh, infections, in, at, at least in the animals. So here are just a couple more examples. Where Belos have also found uh, to be effectively in treating Shigella infections in rabbits, and also they can attack many important uh, pathogens in seafood or uh, other pathogens that are causing the periodontal disease. And most importantly, the, rec the recent study found that they, are they were able to treat multidrug resistant clinical pathogens, which is a, you know, is a big deal. So here's another video from Rory uh, that we can to show you how they wipe out the prey lungs. So here the larger cells, oh here are the prey bacteria. In this case, it's a vibrio species that is a pest that are causing disease in corals in the ocean. And, these, and those fast uh, swimming bacteria, smaller ones that you can barely see, are balos. So by the end of this time, time lapse video, you can see Baylos pretty much clear the bacteria along here. 
this is this process take about is taking about eight an hours eight hours and a half. See now it's only uh, pretty much the predators left at the end. Uh, those are hard working hunters, huh? So this is particularly important in today's era where the um, multi-drug resistant bacteria is on the rise. Actually, both NIH and National Institute of Health and DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agencies, has launched programs recently to search for alternatives to treat uh, bacteria, uh, drug resistant bacteria. And uh, uh, predatory bacteria is definitely uh, promising alternatives here they're looking at. But before I can go further down into the therapeutic potential of balos, here I have to introduce a very important background, that is the balo phylogeny. So decades after they first been discovered in 1964, uh, 1962, I'm sorry, uh, so all the balo members uh, that has the predatory natures were assigned to the genus Bidello vibrio. But then later we find out actually these bacteria, these predators are highly diverse than we currently re recognize. So based on the, the molecular techniques, advancement in uh, the molecular techniques, the original genus Bidello vibrio has subdivided into four genera. Bidello vibrio, Parabacter, Bacterial lithicum and Halobacterial vorax. So the genus Halobacterial vorax is now only con uh, comprised of the balo members that can thrive in salt water. Uh, I will say from now on, the uh, Halobacterial vorax to be uh, uh, I will refer to it as HBX uh, for short, because this is the main, my main area of interest. So uh, we. We, uh, based on the 16S RNA gene sequences, we find out that um, the, actually the, back the HBX can be even further subdivided into eight different clusters, uh, phylotypes. And uh, I will tell you in a minute why this is very important. Because this advancement has enabled, uh, for the first time, the detection of specific HBX phylotypes in the environment. Um, so before this uh, tox toxinomic advancement, most studies focus on Bayless therapeutic potentials, uh, mainly just uh, choose the strains, the predator strain based on the availability. It's like, oh, I have a strain in the lab, uh, the predator strain in the lab that I want to use to treat pathogens. And then what we find is through the pre-susceptibility studies that now we know the predators are different. They have different classes. So we test the different classes of the, back of the predators of HBX against some common clinical isolate, uh, pathogens. And we found that the predation efficiency actually differs very much. So not all the predators are the same. They, so, so then that's why we decided to, in order, rather than randomly select a, a laboratory strain, we should go to the environment where hubble those pathogens and find our best candidates to treat that infection. So we start out by investigating the most efficient killing phylotypes to treat pathogens in oysters. Um, particularly, we're looking at two pathogenic bacteria, Vibro vinificus and Vibro parahemolyticus. Well, Weber vinificus is the leading cause of reported deaths associ uh, associated with seafood consumption in the United States. I hope they don't have the raw seafood here in the menu, but if they do, you probably want to consider taking some predatory bacteria with you as well. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so, uh, I won't bore you with the details with the experimental setup, but basically the idea is we take the seawater and we put in the prey bacteria we want to target. And then the high number of the prey bacteria will give the flask a turbid looking, like shown in the picture. And then at the end of the incubation period, typically it takes five days, uh, the bailer will lyse the prey cells and the, the water will become clear again. So that's how drastic it looks. And if the, present were, the predators were present in the samples, they will form plaques on the bacterial lung. So th 
here the pic the plate is full with uh, is covered with the with the pathogenic bacteria, and these clear zones indicate where the predators are colonized. And then because of uh, we use some advanced uh, molecular technique to find out exactly what type of predators they, they are by sequencing its, uh, its, uh, its, uh, its uh, the genes, the 16S genes. So I, here I just want to use a cartoon to summarize some of our findings because it's kind of a complicated concept. Uh, what we find is that predators, actually the, the prey has a pre, uh, has a impact on the predator's community. So when we feed with Vivero vernificus in the VV model, the predators go through a typical cycle, and the, the, the commu back predator community, uh, to, uh, the, the types they yielded are typically restric restricted to one or two phylotypes. And then if we feed them with Vivero parahemolyticus in a different model, and then uh, the, in the end, we find multiple uh, predator types at the, uh, at the end. So the, this shows for the first time that actually prey has an impact, impact on the structure of the predator's community. Now people study the predator-prey interactions typically only focus on the predator's impact on prey community. Seldom do, do they look at the reverse effect. And here we, we show that actually what type of the predator community is dependent on the, what prey they have in that environment. And this is just an, uh, in addition to the traditional cultural uh, techniques, wh which we grow the bacteria in the lab. We also can use uh, 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 molecular techniques to to study this uh, type of uh, to do this type of study, to monitor the mic microbial community change. And I just it, yeah, it's not that complicated. I'm gonna I'm gonna break it down for you. So this technique is called DGGE denaturing gel electrophoresis. So basically, we're just looking. We use gels to separate bacterial communities. Each band here, as you see, is a bacterial species. So then we can cut these bands and elude the DNA and send for sequencing, and then we will know what type of bacteria it is in the sample. So here in, uh, is just a reconfirmation, uh, a confirmation of what you seen previously in the cartoon, uh, that in the in the Weber vernificus um, microcosms, we typically see one or two below phylotypes, whereas in the Weber parahemolyticus microcosm, we see multiple predator type phylotypes exist. What's neat about these molecular techniques is that we can. It allow us to simultaneously monitor other bacteria at the same time. For example, we can see that the bacteroides or flavor bacteria showed up at the later time points. So it gives you an overall uh, overview of the micro microbial community and as a re changes as a result of predator-prey interaction. So uh, our question, uh, nat natural, another question, natural comments to our mind is that is that is this phenomenon the the, the prey's impact we observe only only because of the two pre, two prey bacteria we selected, or it's a universal phenomenon, and then we we conduct further conducted a very comprehensive studies where involving eight genus uh, eight species of prey bacteria uh, with representatives from fresh water and of, and salt water. And the, re is the result is very interesting. We found that some predators uh, have e extraordinary ability to attack freshwater prey, and then some are particularly good at attacking saltwater prey. So that that that's important because now we know selecting the most uh, efficient phylotype it should be the pre uh, pre uh, prerequisite when we want to use balos for therapeutic uh, treatment. And, and, most and more importantly, we know which phylotype might be a good candidate. So now we know Balos may be able to control, uh, shed some light on the control the infect uh, the pathogenic bacteria. But how, how does that compare to their competitors? As we, I mentioned before, the, the viruses can also attack in bacteria. Here, again, remember the picture, the kiss of, the kiss of death? Uh, this is attacking the prey. And here, the, these dark little particles are viruses. 
so there are, uh, this is a, pic a micrograph showing how they, the like thousands of them attacking a single prey cell. So they both can, so both bellows and the bacteriophages are able to prey on some of the same bacteria, and both have these pros and cons. Uh, but nobody, before, before we did the study, nobody has ever looked at them in combination to treat bacterial infections. What if we put, put both the predators in the same system, and then what will happen? So here is the, the simplified result. So in the environment, if without the predator, uh, the, pr the, the, the growth of the bacteria is limited by the nu nutrient. So it remains co relatively constant in the open ocean when the nutrient is limited. Uh, the numbers won't fluctuate much. But with, with the, the bellows, with HBX here specifically, we see a drastic decrease. So it will able to, HBX in this case, we're able to knock out the prey down to 4.4 logs, which means like 99.999% of the prey uh, can be reduced by bellows. And we also look at the effect of back viruses, uh, effect of viruses, which is weaker compared to bellows. But interestingly, when we put them the two together, we show in blue, uh, uh, the, the both predators exert a quicker control uh, on the bacteria, uh, on the uh, decrease of bacteria. So that, that indicates uh, the uh, potential of using the two, two uh, predators in combination to treat infections. So that sounds like a good idea, right? Uh, that's why we file a provisional pattern on this, using the two predators in combination to treat uh, infections in animals and humans. So, um, and then we, Based on the experimental data, now we are also able to build predatory pre, uh, predator prey models to simulate the results. So we can know exactly uh, how they behave. Uh, the pre we can predict the predation behavior using uh, using mathematical ma mathematical models. If anybody burning to know what these equations uh, is about, we can talk after afterwards. <laughs> so. Basically, uh, what we, what, uh, and uh, then we did further study to find out the, the optimum condition for this type of application, applications. And what, what we find is that environmental factors play a large role in, in terms of which predators uh, play a larger role in control the, uh, the prey bacteria. Uh, then we find, uh, then uh, the optimum condition we find is in for the com combined treatment is in the media with nu moderate nutrient and cell concentration bet uh, between 9 to 21 parts per thousand and temperature between 25 to 37 degrees Celsius. That's the time that you observe the, the greatest reduction of the prey. So during this study, we also observed the very unique biological event phenomenon. So when we look at those samples, water samples under the, micro, uh, under the microscope, of course we find cells infected with bacteriophages. Again, you can see the, the, the cells is uh, dominant by a lot of these dark par particles, which are viruses. And then we also find cells uh, infected with bellows. That's here is a micrograph showing bellows inside the cells. But uh, to our surprise, uh, that very excitingly, we also find cells that can, uh, those that both that were infected by both predators. So you can see here the bellows already inside the pre-cells, and we also find viruses particles inside. So this is uh, this is really. Uh, unexpected because we never expect uh, two fundamentally different biological uh, organisms, viruses and bacteria, able to present in the same sh and share the same pre cells. If you think about it, it's really clever mechanisms, right? In the, when the in the environment, when the prey bacteria is in short supply, and the nutrient, uh, and then the the two predators can share their food resources and growth chambers. It's almost like dinner for two. So. Uh, that that is uh, like, like, that is a very clever mechanism to wait until the food become abundant again. <laughs> so all these exciting uh, findings were not possible 
uh, before we are able to classify Bellows into different phylotypes. But that, that classification is only based on one gene, the 16, 16S RNA genes. Uh, that's one gene among more than 3,000 genes. So the question that we have is like, what, what about, can we drill down further into the genomic structure? Can we, can we even find more, like, uh, more information on that? So, so then we did, uh, uh, we did the genomic study that we're se we, we sequenced uh, the four, t four uh, phylotypes of the predators, two from the low south environment and two from the high south environment. If you remember, they're particularly good at killing freshwater and the saltwater pathogens. And then we, it's just very simple. We incubate them with prey and field out the prey and then get the DNA out and then send for, uh, and we did the genomic sequencing, uh, sequencing to explore its functional and structural differences. And this is the Venn diagrams uh, showing uh, the, geno the genome of the f genomes of the four string we, we sequenced. What we find is actually uh, the among the four Belo isolates, only a third of the genes was shared between Belo members. That means these groups even even more diverse than we pre rec than we currently recognize. And uh, about a third of genes has no hits in the database. It means it's completely novel and we don't know anything about them. And we were able to narrow down like 291 genes were shared between the, uh, the that were core set of genes responsible for this for the predatory nature of bellows. So these, may, these genes may be responsible for an array of the uh, degrade, degraded uh, lytic enzymes that were able, that responsible to kill the prey bacteria. <laughs> so I'm hoping those, these models will, uh, the, these, these five studies will get us uh, one step closer to our ultimate goal, which is using bellows to treat uh, bacteria infections. <laughs> You know the saying is that we should always uh, follow your passion, right? So uh, right now I, pro I have proposed several projects uh, related to Belo at the Mag Lab, um, including looking at the uh, impact of oil dispersant on the bacterial predation. We also want to look at the lipids profile, their lipids profiles, and uh, and characterize their cellular content, and uh, and, and also I'm interested in quorum sensing, which, which is basically study. The, the language between them. Can they talk? How they talk among each other? Is prey has a particularly language to avoid, to, among themselves to avoid predators? These are all unknowns. Uh, I figure since I'm at the Mac lab, I'd better take advantage of this high power instrumentation. One, one uh, highly useful technique is the Fourier transform iron cyclotron resonance mass spectrometry, FTSERMS. So, Previously, there's groups already using the FTSERMS to look at the lipids, uh, lipid, actual lipid A um, in bellows. So this is very powerful techniques to, to uh, characterize the biological uh, molecules at the molecular level. There's a lot can be done in the field. So it's a very exciting topic, but still we left us with so many burning questions. Uh, like like you have uh, one one audience already asked like will, um, how they how they detect the prey right how they find the prey and uh, how they will they, they at attack each other prey on themselves can bacteria phages attacking the bellows and then how bellows recognize the prey uh, uh, how they assimilate the prey able to assimilate the prey cell wall while protecting their own from uh, degradation. And uh, does prey has any anti-predation strategies against predator bacteria? And can bellows live without prey in the environment? Like so many qu interesting questions we don't have an answer for yet. So with that, I would like to uh, thank uh, my, my former PhD advisor and mentor, Dr. Williams, who introduced me to the world of uh, predatory bacteria. Uh, we still, still collaborate and uh, uh, jointly to explore the world of Bellows. And he's actually in the audience right now. Can you, can you wave, Dr. Williams? <laughs> so, 
So he has over 30 years experience on the predatory bacteria is, and is the ASM distinguished lecturer on this subject. So if you have any hard questions, I will devote it to him <laughs> on this subject. All right, that's the end of my story. And I hope you had fun and the research should be continued. And thank you very much. And shower me with questions.